Let's get it. Mike Sempervivi here with you for the next hour talking professional wrestling and mixed martial arts, something we do every single day here on the Sports Byline Broadcasting Network. Tune in iHeart American Forces Radio over the air affiliates, sportsbyline.com, Sirius XM 156 podcast. We're video streaming on Twitch or YouTube. However, you're joining me today. I'd just like to say thank you. It is Good Friday. It's a great Friday. Why? Boss Man's not here. He's out spending time with his family, so I know it's a great day for him. Hopefully, wherever you are, you have the nice weather, and at the very least, you have a, you're have a you just going to have a nice day. See, I'm in a good mood today. I already popped the Red Bull. I'm ready to go. And there's a lot to get into. There's a lot taking place both tonight and this weekend inside the Squared Circle. Tonight on TNT, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, 4 p.m. Pacific. If you are listening to this on the replay, it's too late. You're already missing it. But Rampage is taking place on TNT. The main event, AEW World Heavyweight Championship match between Hangman Adam Page and Adam Cole in a Texas death match tomorrow on TNT is going to be Battle of the Belts 2, headlined by Thunder Rosa and Nyla Rose. We're going to get into those lineups for those shows as well as Saturday's New Japan, Windy City Riot, which there is some speculation in in some circles that the upcoming Tony Khan announcement may be a super show between AEW and New Japan, possibly in Chicago, possibly in June. We'll probably get into that. Speaking of Tony Khan, there's a lot of Tony Khan today as he made his appearance on Sirius XM's Busted Open Radio. There's going to be a whole lot of WWE news to get into as well, too, including tonight's SmackDown live on Fox. They've got two matches already announced for that. They've also announced some lineups taking place on the European tour, which will not feature Brock Lesnar, who will also not be at WrestleMania Backlash. We already knew that, but Dave Meltzer goes into it a little bit more in this week's Wrestling Observer Newsletter, and we'll touch on that, as well as Tony Storm breaking her silence. Saturday night's New Japan pay-per-view from Fukuoka, stardom, and much more. Maybe even your phone calls. We'll see. Wrestling Observer Live. The show, Mike Semper, BB here with your Wrestling Observer Live. You know, we do this show right here for an hour at a time every single day but if you want us 24 7 or at least the chance to get us 24 7 twitter is your best place to go you can follow me at semper vivi the timeline for this show is at w-o-n-f-4-w the broadcaster is at sports byline usa and if you love pro wrestling at mid-atlantic pod brian alvarez's twitter is at brian alvarez he probably will just be tweeting out cute pictures of his kids for the next uh, couple of days, which is fine with me is <laughs> and, and probably fine with him, too, as he is still suffering the effects of questioning whether or not Danhausen needs more explanation on AEW programming. So maybe Danhausen can show up on Busted Open because uh, that seems to be where all the, uh, the the news is coming from today, at least uh, when it comes to AEW, Tony Khan doing some guerrilla promotion, I guess, <laughs> but we'll get to him in a minute. Tony Storm has opened up about her decision to leave WWE, and you can read some of this up on the WrestlingObserver.com website. During an appearance on Sirius XM's Busted Open Radio, Storm said it had been her childhood dream to perform for WWE. However, she eventually realized working for the company was not for her. She says, when I left WWE, I wasn't banking on going anywhere else. I kind of left suddenly and wasn't prepared for life outside of all of that. So I'm just so thankful that Tony Khan reached out and has given me a job, a second chance, an opportunity to do what I love, which is pro wrestling. I'm excited. Storm went on to say that not being able to travel home in the WWE road schedule factored into her unhappiness at the time. She said, I'm not saying that I have a problem with WWE at all. I'm actually really grateful for the time I got to have there. I learned so much, and you know what? It was so cool. It was real, and it was cool. But in the end, it wasn't real cool. <laughs> so uh, something happened, and she doesn't go into this, but something happened, and I left. I felt like I was having an out-of-body experience, to be honest. Have you ever just lost your mind? That's kind of what happened. The stress of not seeing family in years, and then just so many overwhelming things all at once. I've been happier ever since. I guess I just freaked out and went home, she continued. 
this had taken place uh, between uh, Baltimore and Washington. She was in Washington, D.C. Uh, for a house show on December 28th, was going to travel to Baltimore 40 minutes up the road and instead jumped on a plane and was gone. And that was the last time she was seen in WWE. At the time she had left, she was involved in a storyline with Charlotte Flair on SmackDown. Uh, Storm goes on to talk about a, a lot of different things, uh, including having a realization that she just no longer wanted to work there, just realized that it, it was not for her, and what was going on just really wasn't for her, and that's, hey, that's an, an understandable thing, considering the cake in the face that she had with Charlotte Flair, kind of how they presented her, they had brought her up to the main roster, and then she disappeared for a while, they re-debut her, and... You know, the deal with Charlotte wasn't exactly the best. Uh, did it necessarily play to Tony Storm's strengths? Well, if you're a wrestling fan, if you only knew her from WWE, uh, maybe, you know, you don't know. If you saw her in NXT, and even more so if you saw her in stardom and on the independent scene, you'd know that the match she's got coming up with Jamie Hayter, uh, that is uh, looking to be a real banger and looking to be, you know, a real physical wrestling match, at least that's how it seems to be, you know, presented and touted the way Tony Khan and everybody else seems to be talking about it, you know, th that's the way that most people, I think, want to see Tony Storm. So she's getting her chance to do that that as she mentioned her, her tony khan had reached out to her we just heard from her fiance her uh, her beau juice robinson on this show who apparently didn't make new japan very happy by announcing on this show he would not be going back and that he'd be taking some time off so i don't know you know a lot of people after the interview with juice uh they heard it and they were like man Bro sounds tired. I hope he's okay. He sounds really depressed. He, you know, that sort of thing. And, you know, I, I didn't take it that way. We obviously had a chance to, to also interact with him during the break, and I never got that impression. Uh, did he just wake up? <laughs> Possibly. I, I, you know, uh, was he in a, in a relaxed state of mind, say? Surely. Uh, possibly. But I, I never really took it as him being depressed at all, especially because... I don't know. Uh, obviously, he doesn't know what his future is going to bring, and he's going to take it day by day. But, you know, Tony Storm getting reached out to by Tony Khan. I mean, I'm sure Tony Khan knows who Juice Robinson is, and they have a lot of names on their roster. That is for sure. And I'm not saying that he's jumping in right now would be the best thing for Juice Robinson to do or for Tony Khan to reach out to him. But it is impossible for me to believe that a guy who was able to go bet on himself, reinvent himself, start off from the very bottom, work his way, I'd say, to the top of New Japan. I mean, as far as a foreigner in New Japan can make it when you have that level of talent, both native and otherwise, up top. I mean, damn, I mean, Juice had a hell of a run getting up to the U.S. title, and I think he would be a great benefit for AEW uh, if and when that happens, and it is impossible look it's not impossible for me to believe a lot of people walk away from a lot of things when they're burned out and they lose interest or they just want to recharge their batteries but juice is a pretty young guy and i don't know i think he and aew would be a nice fit again there's a lot of names there there's a lot of bodies there there's a lot of people but i think when you have a guy to me and i'm uh, maybe i'm just too big of a fan here when i look at him and what he's been able to do throughout his career Boy, I'd like to see him at least get a shot in AEW, and I think, you know, he would be able to do well there as well, too. I, you know, David Finley, it'll be interesting to see what happens to him. There's a lot of other names, you know, that people would love to see in AEW right now. And getting into what's actually taking place on your television sets with AEW, Saturday night on TNT, it's Battle of the Belts 2 from Garland, Texas, 8 p.m. The show is actually being taped tonight uh, after the, the live rampage, which is going to be taking place. Uh, AEW World, Women's World Championship match, Thunder Rosa against Nyla Rose. AEW TNT Championship match, Scorpio Sky against Sammy Guevara. And the ROH World Championship, Jonathan Gresham against Dalton Castle, taking place on Saturday, as I mentioned, that is being taped, so for all of you who thought that was going to be live or maybe just didn't think about it, be wary of spoilers that will be coming out of tonight's show. Rampage on TNT tonight, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern Time. That has been talked about a lot. 
It is not ideal. Uh, AEW World Championship, Texas Death Match, Hangman Adam Page against Adam Cole. It's going to be Page's sixth defense of the title, and it's a rematch from the Revolution show in March against Adam Page, or I'm sorry, against Adam Cole. It's also going to be Page's second te Texas Death Match World Championship as he uh, defends, as he had one against Lance Archer in February as well. Uh, if he's successful, he ties Kenny Omega for the second most title defenses made behind John Moxley's nine. Also on the show tonight, a Owen Hart Foundation Women's Tournament Qualifier match, Ruby Soho against Robin Renegade. Uh, according to Tony Khan today on Busted Open, it would look like AQA was going to get that spot, but it didn't end up happening. Uh, a, a lot of people took what I said about Ruby Soho yesterday with Brian uh, joking about the fact that, you know, man, they are not using her well and they, she's being buried and all that. That was tongue in cheek. If it wasn't blatantly obvious from my voice and the look on my face, I was kidding. The sky is not falling for Ruby Soho for heaven's sakes. And people, well, she's not on TV. She's made three appearances on TV this year. You know, how many Britt Baker's made on rampage and uh, dynamite five. You know, you can talk about the women's division and all that sorts of stuff. You can talk about how maybe they're not using your favorites on TV enough. They don't use the women's division enough, whatever. But Ruby Soho is much better off now than she was in WWE, and I think she's going to be okay. The biggest thing on this show for some <laughs> is the fact that the Blackpool Combat Club is all getting together. Moxley Danielson and Wheeler Yuta, and they're going to face off against the Gun Club, who are undefeated in trios matches, believe it or not. 24-0 in the entirety of AEW. I have a feeling they're going to get a one hung on them tonight. <laughs> going to be getting into a little bit more about what's taking place this weekend when we come back on Wrestling Observer Live. Saturday night, undefeated IBF and WBC welterweight world champion Errol Spence Jr. taking on Jordanus Ugas. He's coming off his victory over Manny Pacquiao, which took the place of Spence on 11 days notice after Spence injured his eye during training. Uh, that fight Unified welterweight championship, with the exception of Terrence Crawford, is, I believe, the only other person out there. But uh, the show takes place, Jerry World, AT&T Stadium in Dallas, 9 p.m. on Saturday. Why am I mentioning this? Because during the show, there's going to be a live chat taking place, pay-per-view.com, ppv.com, hosted by Boxing Scene's Corey Erdman and featuring some special guests dropping by, including me. So if you plan on ordering the fight, you want to take a little break from watching New Japan, check out what's happening on the fights, watch it, pay-per-view, ppv.com. I got to stop doing that. I see the PPV, I immediately spell out pay-per-view, but ppv.com. Everyone who orders the Spence Ugas fight will automatically be entered into a drawing to win two tickets, plus hotel and airfare to an upcoming ppv.com event. A couple other fights on that card as well, too, but Errol Spence is always fun to watch, so there you go. And I'll take it back to the wrestling now, including tonight, 7 p.m. Once again, that's when Rampage is going to be on. An hour show that leads into Con Air. Con Air is beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern time. That's your two-hour lead-in uh, to the New Orleans uh, Pelicans L.A. Clippers game coming up at 10 p.m. on TNT. It's a play-in game to decide who's going to be the eighth seed in the NBA playoffs. Rampage is going to be up against the other play-in game, which is Atlanta and Cleveland, which begins on at 7.30 on ESPN. I... Con Air is 25 years old, and I, I know they, they love to air movies. In fact, I believe there's a whole Twitter account, uh, the movie, uh, right before Rampage or Dynamite comes on. Um, why the movie couldn't begin at 7 p.m. and go till 9 with Rampage following, I don't know. You know, maybe if I had to, I guess if I'm theorizing something, Maybe it's a gentleman's agreement from Turner Sports to not broadcast any live uh, sports entertainment programming uh, against another broadcast partner's NBA game. I have I have no idea because it certainly wouldn't work in the other direction with ESPN. So I don't know exactly what the reasoning is, but obviously Con Air and it may look maybe they. In, Tony Khan, somebody insists that 7 p.m. is would be better than 8, but uh, I don't know about that. 
Dynamite on Wednesday. Speaking of that, under a million viewers averaged 977,000, which was down 1.2% from the previous week. Lowest audience for the show since March 9th. Dynamite drew a 0.37 rating in the 18 to 49 demo, down 2.6% from last week. The 18 to 49 rating is Dynamite's lowest number in the category since March 2nd. The TBS show finished third on the cable charts, trailing two NBA playoff games on or play in games on ESPN. Uh, the play in games averaged 2.44 and 2.11 million viewers, respectively, uh, and also did uh, quite well, uh, basically tripling Dynamite in the 18 to 49 demo. No surprise there. The high points of the show were CM Punk against Penta, which did 1.131 million viewers and averaged 530. 30,000 between the ages of 18 to 49. While the last four minutes of Punk and Penta, the Chris Jericho airport angle, and the first half of Jurassic Express against Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly for the tag team titles did 1.044 million viewers and 532,018 to 49s, which ended up being that demo's high point. So... There you go. The the week's episode. This is this week is one point one percent down in viewers as compared to the average about the last ten or eleven weeks. As you can see, if you go up to the WrestlingObserver dot com uh, main page of the site, there's a write up there about it. So I, I'm sure somebody is 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 you know out there planting their flag over AEW dying that it didn't do a million viewers, but. The NBA is going to win. The NFL is going to win. The NBA is going to win. And that's just how it goes. The NHL won't win. But, you know, unfortunately for wrestling fans, uh, it is a prestige sport with with higher prestige viewership and higher prestige sponsors associated with it. So I know that's something that at least on our board and in some circles, because there are, especially in the States, especially the further south you go, where there are less and less hockey fans, and they are just mystified by the fact that hockey is, wrestling has got to take a, a backseat, and AEW has to take a backseat to hockey. But that's just the way it goes. Uh, for those of you who lived through the... The dog show, what is it? The the kennel club of whatever the hell it is, but the dog show on USA every single year. That would USA US Open tennis was another one that would also push Raw out of the way, but it was always that Westminster Kennel Club show that would really drive people nuts. Uh, but that's how it works <laughs> when it comes to that sort of thing. Tony Khan has been everywhere today uh, just by making one appearance on Busted Open. And uh, <laughs> the biggest thing, uh, Santam Singh's debut on Wednesday, he believes they could have handled it differently. Uh, speaking on Busted Open Radio today, Khan says, and this write-up is up at WrestlingObserver.com as well, too. I could have done it better. It's one of those things. I wish I had done it a little bit differently. There were things about it I, I probably shouldn't have. I sh pardon me. Uh, there were things uh, about it I probably shouldn't have done differently. Now I see in hindsight. To be honest, it wasn't my idea to turn the lights out. And really, that's the bottom line of all this when it comes right down to it. He says it early in the interview because I had a chance to hear it that it was somebody with 30 years experience that that said it and suggested it. And he says right after that, but. The bottom line is it's me and I'm the filter and I'm the one responsible. And then later on, uh, he goes and actually reiterates that point that somebody with 30 years of experience in pro wrestling brought this up and everybody was sitting around with it and nobody said anything. And after the fact, they all went, eh, <laughs> maybe we shouldn't have did that. A lot of talk over this whole thing, and I know if if Tony, you know, if you don't like Tony Khan, uh, I'm sure you're you're piling on that he's throwing somebody under the bus. I I I have no animus towards Tony Khan. I will say this, honestly, you know, listening to it, you could easily take it that way, <laughs> and you could take it that way the same way that like, you know, anybody who said that, man, I don't want to make any excuses, but I. 
pulled my hamstring and I, I couldn't spar and I couldn't train and this happened, that happened. But you know what? Bottom line is he beat me. So, well, you already laid out the excuses there and kind of distanced yourself from it. And I think I know what he I, I, honestly, I, I don't believe that he did that with any malice. People are pointing back to like the, the pyro going off and him saying they him throwing somebody under the bus for that and all that. Look, I, I just think he maybe misspoke. And he puts himself out there, and he does it a lot. And he seems to be on Twitter right now, still talking about this with people. So, you know, which, by the way, is serving also as promotion for tonight and keeping, you know, things. And I know some people don't, you know, will look at that as a big negative. But I don't I don't think in this case it necessarily is to, like, you know, get people amped up and talking about Santam Singh and, and keeping uh, Dynamite and Rampage at a weird time tonight in, in everybody's minds. I think, you know, there's an ulterior motive to him doing all this stuff, which is the promotion part of it. But all he really had to say was, you know what? We were sitting around and it wasn't just me. He didn't even say that. It was me. It was my crew. And somebody had brought it up. And I said, yeah, let's go. And after the fact, we all said, no, that wasn't the way to go. That probably would have been the way to do it, you know, to save himself some of this backlash that he's getting over people, you know, saying he's throwing people under buses and all that sort of stuff. You know, it, it, once again, though, he also, you know, mentions the fans and mentions how smart they were for as all these people are coming up with ideas of what they would have done uh, with hindsight being 2020. He's, he's actually on Twitter right now, kind of playing into some of those things, too. Yeah, you know, I wish we would have did that, too. So, you know, again, playing both sides of the coin here. He's a promoter. He explained it. It's not going to be enough for some people. It's going to be too much for other people. But. That's that's how it goes when it comes to Tony Khan and his appearance on Busted Open Radio. And again, got everybody talking today uh, about this deal. In fact, he mentioned that Santam Singh deal is the number one thing that has was was rewatched from that show. Again, I, you know where where those numbers come from. I don't know. Could they possibly have been bots? Maybe uh, I don't know. But that you know that's what he said. So. Keeping everybody, every, everything in the mix there, and, and that's enough of Tony for right now. SmackDown tonight, DCU Center in Worcester, Massachusetts. Show's almost sold out. It wasn't scaled for a whole lot, but the show's almost sold out. And uh, coming up on it, WWE has made some announcements of what's going to be taking place on the show right before it came on the air. It was announced that Ricochet will be defending the United States Championship against Jinder Mahal. As I pull that up from WWE.com here. Do, do, do. See, I thought I actually had it saved. Oh, wait, there it is. As I have a, a Brian moment of, of searching the internet here on the show. But uh, yeah, sorry, the Intercontinental Champion. Finn Balor is the U.S. Champion. How dare I forget about that since neither one of those men had a path to WrestleMania this year. But Jinder Mahal is going to challenge Ricochet for the Intercontinental title. Could we see a title change? Possibly. <laughs> Possibly we could. Uh, just because why not? You know, either that or I could see this ending in some sort of non-finish where, you know, somebody gets involved, uh, whether it be Shanky or something like that, which leads to a match at Backlash. Also coming up on the show tonight, Drew McIntyre against Sami Zayn. Going to open up the phone lines, 1-800-878-PLAY, 1-800-878-7529. Give me a call. Wrestling Observer Live. Wrestling Observer Live. R.A. the Rugged Man, old white guy like me, also likes boxing. See, that's all that's left for people that like boxing, just old guys. <laughs> I'd like to say that's not the case. Oh, by the way, Gervonta Davis, uh, who's got a fight coming up at the end of May, got Booker T trending today on Twitter. I, uh, I'll have you, uh, you'll have to go listen to the clip for yourself since none of what was played uh, could be actually aired on the radio without picking up massive FCC fines and and multiple back-to-back -back suspensions that I would stack up, so I won't play that, but you can find that, and that's the reason the Booker T was trending. Uh, some... Uh, an unfortunate shadow to bring up, but it seems like everybody is bringing this up. They're... The specter of WWE releases. Did I use the term specter correctly? I believe I did. Uh, there is still a ghost over from last year at around this time where 
there was a huge uh, bloodletting of talent. Uh, the Iconics, Samoa Joe, Kalisto, Mickey James, Mojo Raleigh, Bo Dallas, uh, Tucker, Chelsea Green, one after uh, uh, Buddy Murphy. It, just one person after another ended up getting released. There are people believing that well, we we've gone through ninety days, you know the of the first quarter of the year here. We may be seeing some more. So hopefully, uh, hopefully that is not the case for anybody. I don't want to see anybody lose their job unless it's uh, unless it's Mustafa Ali who absolutely would like to lose his current job and go somewhere else. So if there are going to be releases and Mustafa Ali is not one of them. Boy, that, that that will make for some some noisy banter on Twitter. Uh, there's gonna be a, I got a bunch of other WWE stuff to get into, but before we do that, we will go to our friend from the Twitch chat, Dagan, on the line right now. Dagan, what's going on on this Friday? Hey, what's going on, Mike? Good talking to you. What's up, Twitch homies? So, listen, I just wanted to quickly get my thoughts out about this ending that we got the other night on Dynamite and. I was not a fan of it. I know a lot of people said it was bad. Um, but I, it seems like we go through this pattern every time that something like this happens, whether it be Chris Jericho falling on boxes or a bomb not going off, where it's just like everybody takes that one moment and they hyper-focus on it, and it's like, now AEW's dead, doom and gloom, all this stuff. And... Look, I, I get that it could have been done a little bit differently, but I think, personally, that was by far not the worst ending or angle that we've ever had on AEW. So I think that people should maybe focus on how great the wrestling was that we got on that show, that Minoru Suzuki, uh, Samoa Joe match, just awesome. Uh, the tag title match with Red Dragon and, and uh, Jurassic Express. So I think there's a lot of really great stuff on that show. And I think people are really hyper-focusing on the negatives, and that's just my opinion on it, but I get, you know, uh, other people's opinions as well. So just wanted to say that. And uh, thanks for taking my call, Mike. Appreciate it. Absolutely, Dagan. Appreciate that, man. I think it's just, you know, it's a matter of just some people are just trolling. And look, some people are just actually just joking around, taking the piss out of things and, and having fun with the fact that it was such a flat thing and... You might see them on social media, and it looks like they're piling on when really they're just they're just cracking jokes. But you know, if some people see that and they're they have their flag planted, and they may get really really upset. And there are people that maybe they believe that you know all these things are the death knell for AEW or something like that. But I think it's just trolling, and I think it's just people who have planted their flag. And we see this on both sides of the ledger too. You know, the WWE ones, the the stand up for WWE ones. You know, <laughs> they are they tend to be you know worse. But we do actually see this on on both sides of the coin. Bottom line though is it's not the end of the world. And that debut going the whole thing like it turned Michael the lights California. out. That's the reason that it was disappointing, you know, because the lights were out and people would have they thought the lights were going to come back on and like Cesaro would be there. It's like if he had lumbered down and walked down the aisle, would that have made it any better? If he had like rose up from the, the Phoenix in the crowd or something like that and like charged the ring. Actually, that one maybe if he did charge the ring out of the crowd like a maniac, that probably would have been the way to do it. But then it really, you know, I don't know how that would have played into to to, to Jay Lethal being there and all that. I, I hey, <laughs> I I don't know, I don't know. But Sanjay Dutt uh, is very good. Jay Lethal is obviously very good. We'll have to see how they decide to use this guy. You know, I don't know. He's been training, but how much training has he done? He did not impress me or like really shock me with his mobility or anything like that. You know, uh, I who knows? Yeah, who knows? But th it's being done for a reason, which obviously is is a appealing to the Indian market, which, again, much like the great Kali and other people they've tried like veer right now hopefully you know veer can be that guy i don't think they've got him off on the best foot with the character that he is but we'll see how that all goes down um it's not the end of the world and, and maybe the fact that people are still talking about it now is is may actually be a good thing instead of just forgetting about it all together and just wanting to wipe your feet on it and then getting the groan when you come back next time around at least this way you know 
Again, I don't know what AEW can possibly do uh, and what their plans are going to be for him, uh, but obviously he's, he's, he's very important to them. I missed who was on the line. I know they're in California right now, but but take it back to the phones. Uh, caller in California, are you there? And apparently he's not. Just want to oh, say first go. time, long time. Oh, hi, hi. Uh, Marcus from Tustin here. Just wanted to say first time, long time. Uh, happy to be here with uh, on a mic day, right? Got that blue Red Bull here in solidarity with you. Um, I just wanted to bring up a point I feel like probably doesn't get thought about that much with the uh, entrance music in WWE. I feel like a lot of people feel like it's very subpar right now. And um, I feel like it might just be a product of like the same thing we see with the, you know, the matches we don't like, the finishes we don't like, the production that we don't like. I mean, everybody's performing for an audience of one there. Everybody that's on staff there is making things for one guy, you know. So I don't necessarily think that the people making the music are the worst at what they're doing, but maybe, you know, the person that they're giving the work to is requiring, you know, the bare minimum. I don't know. Well, let, well, let me ask you a question. Let me, in, let me throw right this by you, off. though. Let me throw this by you. Um, because Jim Johnson was making, you know, music for one guy. CFO was making music, you know, for one guy. And those, you know, those particular, you know, units have now, obviously, they're gone from there. And they have new people doing music. They were doing the same thing, but the music seemed to get over better, and people seemed to react to some of that music better. Do you think it's just a matter of people just have not liked some of these? They don't look at them as theme bangers, you know, so far? you think it's just a matter of it comes down to the music? I think it's partially that, but they're also, you know, very much playing into the style of what is popular at the moment. You know, a lot of these themes are filled with these 808 kicks and a lot of, you know, Hip hop, trap, and t- inspired like drums and stuff. It seems like they're going, they're trying to like think in the direction that they want to. But I mean, in the same position, Jim Johnson was making music for a Vince McMahon that was 20 years younger, 30 years younger. You know what I mean? And there was a lot, I feel like, you know, you can go back and watch interviews with people, and I feel like they have a lot more involvement with what, what they were able to put into their music. They were a lot more closely involved with the process of making the music in WWE, which is, you know, something we see a lot more of today in AEW, where every but he's loving what Mikey Ruckus is doing. I mean, the man, you know, doing incredible things, you know, and mainly it's because he's, you know, able to do what he's able to do. I feel like, you know, as much as that is a very valid point, like you got to remember that the dude is older and he's probably just going to play to what is he's being told and fed to is what is popular. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely, Marcus. I thank you very much for the call. And, and yeah, I mean, I, you know, it's interesting. That is really interesting, you know, to, to think about. You know, AEW, again, they they have a lot. Guys have a lot more freedom. We've heard about them, you know, giving ideas and all that sort of stuff. And it just, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think about, I know, I think some of the music has gotten a bad rap, too, in WWE. I, I think some of it has. And, again, I know it's people have their personal favorites and they have styles and things like that that they like. But... I think that's one of the, when it comes to NXT, that is low on the priority list uh, right now. Uh, like, cause, for, an, cause for an example, for an example, Roman Reigns, the, re- the theme that he has is perfect. And I know like some of it comes from like the gold dust thing or the, the chime in the background and all, but it's a badass larger in life theme for a larger than life guy. And I think it's been a very good one. I think they've had some other good ones as well, too. I haven't been bullish on a lot of the, the NXT themes, even going back. I think a lot of them, you know, some have been better than others, but again, my old ass, uh, that, that won't even worry about that. Uh, let me just throw this out there. Uh, WWE has announced uh, three matches for upcoming events in London and Paris, which are part of the company's next European house show tour. The London house show is being held at the O2 Arena on Friday, April 29th, while the Paris show is scheduled for a core arena. A core? ACR? ACCOR. Acor, I don't know. I'm an American. Saturday, April 30th, filing matches have been announced for both events. Roman Reigns defend the, defends the WWE Universal Championship against Drew McIntyre, while SmackDown Women's Champion Charlotte Flair defends against Ronda Rousey. 
and Raw champions RK Bro defend against SmackDown champions the Usos. The tour also is going to have stops in Newcastle and in Leipzig, Germany. Uh, Reigns and Rousey have only been announced for the London and Paris shows. Somebody who is not going to be on that show is Brock Lesnar. And uh, Brock Lesnar was was never scheduled to be at WrestleMania Backlash either. As Dave Meltzer reports this week in the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, which just went up for subscribers this morning, uh, he reports that there was never a plan to have him at the pay-per-view. He was recently pulled from the advertising after initially uh, appearing on the promotional material for the show. Earlier this month, Lesnar lost the title unification match to Roman Reigns in the main event of WrestleMania. In the 38 night two reigns became the undisputed WWE Universal Champion by winning that match. Uh, Lesnar has not appeared on WWE TV since WrestleMania. He's advertised for Money in the Bank uh, at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas on Saturday, July 2nd. SummerSlam at Nissan Stadium in Nashville on Saturday, July 3rd. 30th. So there is that. Backlash is going to be taking place at the Dunkin' Donut Center in Providence, Rhode Island on Sunday, May 8th. Going to take it back to the phones now. Orange County, what's your name and what's going on? Uh, yeah, this is Don in Orange County, Mike. I wanted to talk about GCW. Surely. That's a little bit of topic of conversation today uh, for what's been in the uh, Observer. So I'm I'm calling because it's been two weeks since the collective, and no one on the show has mentioned the debut of early morning guy steel. <laughs> I, I heard early morning guy steel. Yes, I, I, apparently he's got a, a brand new Twitter account out there following his success at the uh, Joey Janela Spring Break uh, Cluster um, Battle. Uh, the battle royal that took place. Are you he impressed was, by early morning guys? It was the most exciting thing to me. I Well, I was there at the collective. I went to all the shows of the collective, and a lot of stuff got talked about, but it was the most interesting thing to me of the weekend. <laughs> uh, for those, who... I don't know what this guy is, but uh, I'll be following him. Well, uh, who do you think it is? <laughs> I think it's Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes? <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know if it's Cody Rhodes, but Don, I want to thank you very much for the phone call. Yes, uh, get into that a little bit more after the break here, as well as mentioning what is going to be taking place. New Japan, Chicago, tomorrow, sold-out show, big show, going to be leading into uh, Fukuoka on May 1st. Kazuchika Okada and Naito. And then, of course, Team Filthy. That's going to be the most important thing. USJ Open Challenge. Filthy Tom Lawler against Nagata will be back. So much stuff to get into today. I didn't even mention uh, that Windy City Riot was going to be taking place. I wanted to get into that a little bit more, uh, considering that the Super J cast, uh, even by their own accord, wildly speculating, but uh, wildly speculating that it's possible that AEW and New Japan uh, working a super show, possibly in Chicago, uh, could be what Tony Khan's big announcement is. We'll have to see about that, but it is going to be a big show sold out in Chicago. Chicago tomorrow night. Uh, US of J Open Challenge. Jay White against a mystery opponent. Toro Suzuki against Tomohiro Ishii. John Moxley against Will Ospreay is going to be the main event of that match, but the main event for everybody here on this site and me, Filthy Tom Lawler against Yuji Nagata. Yuji Nagata, one of my all time favorite professional wrestlers. You have no idea how upset I was way back when, when they decided to put him in a fight with Mirko Crow Cop. It actually had reignited that that particular event was one of the big things that reignited my interest in Japanese wrestling that I always had had a a minor knowledge and appreciation of, you know, watching videotapes, playing the, the WCW versus the world and all those sorts of games. You know, I, I, I liked New Japan. I got heavy into it at that time because of that fight and what had happened with Yuji Nagata. But facing Tom Lawler and you know what? 
What happened with Crow Cop, what happened with Feodor, it could very well happen again with Filthy Tom Waller. That's how much faith I have in my New Japan Strong Openweight Champion. I get to see all those guys coming up in D.C. Uh, May 14th it is, so I don't expect to see Juice Robinson there. But, hey, everybody, I hope you have a great weekend. Uh, as far as I know, Jim Valley is going to be on Saturday. Uh, Andrew Zarian and those guys are going to be on Sunday. For Brian Alvarez, my name is Mike Sempervivi. Have a safe and happy hot Passover, Easter, or whatever the hell it is you celebrate. Enjoy your weekend, everybody. Wrestling Observer Live. <laughs>